Well, this evening, if you have your Bibles, feel uh, uh, free to open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, or you can, of course, follow along on the screen behind me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'd like to read verses uh, 1 through 9 as we get started. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says regarding the afterlife, what's going to happen to Christians after death. It's not the end, of course, but it's really the beginning in many ways. This is what Paul writes. He says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening. Now again, this morning we were, cons we were looking at why John wrote his gospel, and again, the purpose was quite clear, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, he says, you might have life in his name. But of course, in order to, for that to be a motivation to us, we do need to understand what John means by life, and I think we do have a fairly good understanding, but it wouldn't hurt us to, to review. What does John mean? by life. Was he referring to the relationship that you can have with God, that you can become his sons and his daughters? Uh, was he talking about the continuation of life, uh, that you would continue to exist after your life in this world is over? Or was he referring to the quality of life or to a particular quality of life that begins here and continues when you die? Well, the answer is yes. That's what John was, as a matter of fact, referring to. Eternal life is made up of at least these three things, and that's what I would like for us to consider this evening. Eternal life is, is really three things. It's a relationship. It's a quality of life that begins here on earth and continues in heaven, and it is a duration of life. Now, John says that if you believe in Jesus, you have life in his name. And that means, first of all, that you have a relationship, a, a new relationship that you didn't have before with the Father and with the Son. Jesus tells us in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And again, we understand that Jesus doesn't mean by this that they might know about you. I mean, anybody can pick up a Bible and learn about God. They can learn about Jesus Christ, but that they may know you or that you may know Jesus, that you may know God in a personal way, in a relational way. And that is not something that we had when we came into the world. It's a great blessing. It should be no surprise to you by now that that wasn't your relationship to God when you first entered the world. You weren't his friends. Sometimes we're actually surprised to find out the Bible says we were enemies, actually <clears throat> mutual enemies. We read in Romans 5.10, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, sometimes we read that to mean that we were the enemies of God. We hated him, but we need to understand the feelings were, in a very real sense, mutual. You hated God. That's certainly clear. Romans 8, verses 6 through 8. Paul is describing what we were like prior to God's mercy. 
For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hostility toward God sounds to me like we hated God. We did as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, when Paul is expressing in Romans chapter 1 all the different things that God is judging the world for, one of the things he includes is they are haters of God. But do you realize that God also hated you when you came into the world? And again, we have to realize there's different senses in which the Bible means these things. Yes, there's a sense in which God did love us, but there's also a sense in which he hated us because we practiced the things that he hates. Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5. The psalmist writes, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. And who is it that does iniquity? But every single one of us. Paul tells us our condition coming into the world is we were not seeking after God. We wanted nothing to do with God. That was our condition. Our mind was set on the flesh. We practiced iniquity. We could not please God. God hated us. And because of that hatred that was between God and us, you and I were actually at war with him, which is the reason why we came into this world under God's wrath. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, which means we were born under God's wrath, and that's what we deserve because the things we were doing were not pleasing to God. All they did was draw out his, his anger, really. And God, in his justice, had to judge us, and that's certainly what would have happened. But again, God changed all this, didn't he? The Father changed it by sending his Son into the world. Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now we already saw that John told us this morning, if you will simply receive his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll simply uh, accept, as it were, this olive branch of peace that he extends to you, that there will be peace between you and God. And again, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction in, by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. But you see, the, the reconciliation and the laying down of weapons, the peace that our Lord Jesus Christ brings is really just the beginning. There is also a relationship that is formed. You were the children of wrath. You were the children of this world. But now you are children of God. John 1 verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them he, he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And again, John writes in 1 John 3, 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Do you have trouble with the world around you and the people of the world? Well, this is the reason why, is because being in the family of God, the world hates you even as they hated him. So we came into the world with God as our enemy, with God as our judge, 
But the Lord Jesus Christ has changed all of that when we trusted in Him. The Father, Jesus' Father, is now your Father. And you are now His sons and daughters. You have a new relationship. He has adopted you into His family. But now that you're a son or daughter of God, you also have a changed relationship with Jesus Christ. You are His brothers and His sisters. Matthew 12, verses 47 through 50, someone said to him, that is to Jesus, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Your relationship to Jesus has changed. You are his brothers and sisters. And that makes you now the heirs of his kingdom. Because you are a joint heir with Christ. Being in Christ who is an heir of the kingdom, you yourself become an heir of that same kingdom. Romans 8 verses 16 through 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. And that suffering, of course, comes from the fact that the world doesn't know us, the world hates us, because we are the Lord's. But again, I would remind you, first of all, what John said with regard to how you enter into this relationship, there's only one way that you can. There's only one way that you can have eternal life, and that is by trusting Jesus. If you haven't received Him, if you haven't trusted Him as your Savior, if you haven't surrendered to Him as Lord, then you are still a child of the world, still a child of the devil. You are still a child of wrath and on your way to judgment. You must turn from your sins. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before you can have this relationship. Now, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ means second with regard to life, that you enjoy an entirely new quality of life in this world. And again, I'm trying to move a little bit more quickly through these first two sections because we're very familiar with these. We've dealt with them fairly uh, recently. But Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now we looked at how the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, places us in the Lord Jesus Christ and unites us with Him. When He does that, you become a new creature because you are now part of the new creation. Jesus came into the world not just to make His people new, but to make the whole creation new again. Sin destroyed it. Jesus comes to redeem it. When you trust in Jesus, you become a part of that new creation. Your soul is renewed. When the Spirit puts you into Jesus Christ, His life begins to flow through you, as it were. And that causes His image to be formed in you. You begin to become like Him. This is also something that is new. This is a new life that is in you. As a matter of fact, Peter calls it a divine life in a certain way. He says you become partakers of the divine nature. In 2 Peter 1.4, he says, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You know, of course, he doesn't mean by this that you become you know, uh, partakers of the divine essence, that somehow you begin to share in the being of God, that you begin to agree with, with Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagin that you become little gods because God begets gods. That's not what he means at all. Or like the Worldwide Church of God used to teach, I understand they've somewhat disbanded, at least part of them have, but they believe that everyone who joined their organization would become a part of the Godhead. That there isn't just a trinity, but everybody who joins their organizations gets to join the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in inequality within the Godhead. That's certainly not what Peter is referring to. God is always going to be God and we are always going to be creatures. But what he means is that you begin to share in his holy nature because the Spirit has united himself to your soul and he is working his own image within you. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect in this life or just like Jesus. Again, because the remnants of the old man that are still in you, we still have indwelling corruption. But it does mean that you will continually be becoming more like Him. But I just want to remind you on this point, see, that God gives you this life. He gives you His Spirit to begin to transform you from the inside out. But this work is not automatic. You don't just kick your car, as it were, you're into neutral and just kind of coast along and God's pushing you, as it were, from behind. There's cooperation on your part. It's, it's a cooperative work to become more like Jesus Christ, which is why Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you can do this. The people who are in the world can't do this because they don't have the Spirit, which is why Paul says what he says in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, God is in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I and mean, sometimes, you know, I don't know if you've ever run across this passage and had difficulty understanding what he's saying. Paul emphasizes so strongly salvation is by grace through faith alone and not by works. And then he tells us, work out your salvation. What does he mean by that? Well, he's not saying work out your justification because that's something that you get purely by the grace of God, by trusting in Jesus. But salvation is a much broader thing. And there is a work for us to do. And that work is to put off the old man and put on the new. To put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for our flesh. That's something we're involved in. And so Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But remember, the only reason why you can do this is because God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is that divine nature that you're a partaker of. This is the Spirit of God working within you. This is a new quality of life, and it's a part of that eternal life that John says is yours for trusting Jesus Christ. Now finally, and we'll take a little bit more time on this particular point, if you believe in Jesus, you will enjoy a quality of life that will never end. And this is what we usually think of when we think of eternal life, is what's going to happen after this life is over. Now, in a certain sense, everybody has a life or a kind of life that never ends. But not everyone's going to inherit the same quality of life that you will inherit for trusting in Jesus. Those who haven't trusted Jesus will live forever, in a certain sense, right? But they will in the torment of hell in the lake of fire. And that's something I think we need to remind ourselves of. Everybody is not well in this world. It's not going to go well for them. It's not good for them. If they die in their sins, they have nothing to look forward to but judgment. Revelation 20, verses 12 and 15, looking ahead to the day of judgment, and I believe this is referring to the same thing that Matthew 25 is referring to, the sheep and goat judgment. Only here it's focusing on those who have not trusted Jesus, John writes this, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Again, we see that in the sheep and goat judgment. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I do want to point out that um, John does say here that everybody is judged according to their deeds and not according to their profession or even according to their faith. But I do want to remind you that they are actually being judged according to their faith because if you trust in Jesus... 
you will do good works and your works will show that you truly are trusting Jesus. And that's why in the sheep and goat judgment, and which is the same judgment as this one, it is your deeds, your works that are being judged, not your profession, but how you lived, whether or not you have become a partaker of the divine nature and Christ is being formed in you. If it is, it will show in the way you live. And so their lives are under examination. But I do want you to see that even those who don't trust in Jesus will have a kind of life that goes on forever, but the Bible doesn't call this life, it's existence that goes on forever, but it's not life really, it's death. A sentence of death, the second death, the lake of fire that one has to endure forever. And again, this above all things perhaps is the reason why most people may begin to listen to Jesus Christ if they can get out of this sentence. This is very real and Jesus is the only way that it can be escaped. He's the only way to receive life rather than death. But again, we, we're not wanna, we don't want to focus on that so much right now, but what we do want to focus on is this. What about those who have trusted Jesus Christ? What's it going to be like for them? Well, they're going to inherit a different quality of life. The Bible says there's basically two phases of life that those who have trusted, that you who have trusted in Jesus Christ are actually going to enjoy after you leave this world. There is that time from the time we die until just before the judgment. And then there is that phase, as it were, that state just before the final judgment that continues into eternity. Now, Paul, in the text that I read earlier, I hope you haven't forgotten, I did read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 9, I believe has both of these in view in this passage, and sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. I think we'd all admit if we've read this passage or listened to what I was reading, it does, it does sound like, like Paul is sort of skipping one of these phases, but we'll see that he actually can't be. But he says this in verse 1, For we know that if the earthly tent which is our house is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So what Paul is saying here is that when your earthly home, which of course is your body, which Paul here calls a tent, because tents aren't permanent, when, when it's torn down, when literally I believe behind the Greek word is when the stakes are pulled up and the tent is, is taken down, it's time to move on. In other words, when you die, you have a building from God. A house not made with hands, one that is permanent, one that is eternal. You have something that's going to be longer lasting than this tent. You have a structure that God has made. In other words, you have a resurrection body. I believe that's what Paul is talking about here. Now it almost looks as though Paul is saying that you're going to have this immediately after death, which has led some to believe, and I've actually heard this taught before, and, I, and you can understand why they might say this that after we die, we do receive a kind of body that's a temporary spiritual body as soon as we get to heaven. In other words, we shed this tent and we get something else. But yet, the way this body is described, the fact that it's eternal, the fact that it's, it's a permanent, the word house there is referring to like a permanent dwelling versus one that, again, can be taken down and put up in various places like a tent. Uh, indicates to us that, that this is in fact the resurrection body uh, and not some kind of te temporary body. And we know from other parts of Scripture that that is not something we receive immediately after we die, but something that we won't receive until after the resurrection. So I think what we have here in the Apostle Paul is that he is combining the two events. Now he often does that in Scripture. We have to recognize that. Especially when he has in view the second coming, right? The second coming, because this is exactly what's going to happen at the second coming in rapture. And maybe he has that in view. If you happen to live to see that, and depending upon your eschatology, your view of last things, you may think that you are going to live to see that. Or maybe if you have a differing view, maybe you'll see that, well, maybe we're not going to live to see that happen. But if you did, your earthly tent, when Jesus comes back, would immediately be thrown off. And you would immediately receive your resurrection body. Actually, your body and your resurrection body are really the same body. 
Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. So what I'm saying is here, if you live to to the resurrection, as it were, to the second coming where the dead are raised, then this will happen immediately. Your tent, as it were, is torn down. The temporary body is changed into a permanent body. And maybe Paul has that in view. But I think it's more likely that he's looking past what happens at death to the resurrection which happens, of course, at the return of Christ, because it it is clear that he is speaking about the resurrection body. I know Paul is very much aware that there is another state and there is a time between when we die and when, of course, we receive this resurrection body. As a matter of fact, it was, he told us quite plainly that when Jesus returns in 1 Corinthians 15, the dead will be raised imperishable, which means there are people's, you know, bodies that are in the ground and they haven't yet received that glorified body. So how do we know that Paul here is actually referring to a resurrection body and he's not referring to some kind of spiritual temporary body that we receive between now and the time of the resurrection? Well, for one thing, he says that it's permanent. He says it's eternal, that it's in heaven, that this is the body that you're going to receive. So if it's eternal, if it's permanent, then how can it only be temporary? For another thing, Jesus used exactly the same language to refer to his resurrection body. At least that's what those who testified against him said in Mark 14, verse 58. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Now, the account in John didn't include this language, but it's it's quite possible that Jesus actually did say this. And what is this body made without hands? It is Jesus' own body, glorified, raised again, and raised incorruptible and imperishable. It is this resurrection body. Now, what will this body that we're going to receive then be like? Well, we're not given too many specifics. We're not told exactly what it's going to look like. I think some of us would would like perhaps some modifications done to it so we don't look exactly the way we look right now. We want to look better than we look right now. Well, we're all going to look better because the body that we're going to receive is actually going to be like Jesus' glorified body. Paul writes in Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Now that's pretty general, but I kind of like what he's saying here. Our body is going to be like His. Transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. Well, what else do we know about this body? We know it's going to be a body that isn't subject to death. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. The Bible says that this body is going to be glorious, it's going to be wonderful, that just thinking about it makes us long to have it. That's what Paul actually was expressing in this text that we read to begin with. Verse 2, for indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And in verse 4 he says, for indeed while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now certainly in the bodies that we have right now, you can get hurt. You You can be hurt physically. You can be hurt emotionally. As you get older, you can become more and more limited as to what you're able to do. And in this body, there is that continual struggle between the flesh and the spirit. 
so that you can't do the things that you would like to do in the way that you would like to do them. We would all love to love God perfectly and to treat our neighbor as ourselves. Well, you know, when you're clothed with your new body, you're not going to be plagued by these things ever again. We've already seen there's going to be no more tears, no more pain, no more sin. Revelation 21, verses 3 through 4, John writes this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them, and He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. The only way that can happen is if all the weakness and infirmity of our bodies is done away with, the sin that is in our souls is completely gone. That's the only way this can happen, and that's exactly what's going to happen when we receive these bodies. Now, the thought of these blessings not just of the, of the bodies that we're going to receive, but of heaven itself, of being with the Lord, of the beatific vision and everything else that comes with being in heaven, to see God with our own eyes, to be in the blessed presence of the Lamb, to see the one who laid down his life for us, who loved us so much and has prepared all these things for us to enjoy these bodies which in other places is called it's a spiritual body by which we understand a body perfectly filled with the Spirit of God so that we become spiritual in every sense of the word, perfected. You know, the thoughts of these blessings are so great that Paul writes that you should much rather be there than here. Much, much more so. Verses 6 through 8 of our text, he says this, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say. And prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That should be our preference. If we understand this, if we believe it, if we desire it, how can we not? He also writes in Romans 8, verses 22 through 23, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now, you know, there's really something that's in, not just implied, but plainly stated here that we don't often think about. But the creation is, now I do believe this is personification. I don't think the creation actually has a personality and that it's suffering. But... There's a sense in which the creation is, is groaning and desiring to be set free from corruption. I told you that Jesus came into the world to redeem the, the creation. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth that has a connection with the old heavens and the old earth in the same way that our glorified bodies have a connection with the bodies we have now. In other words, it's the same creation, only purified. Jesus comes into the world to redeem the whole creation. And the creation is pictured here as desiring to be set free from the corruption that man put it under. Adam, by his sin, brought a curse upon the world, which is why we have all the difficulties we have. So the creation, as it were, is groaning, but we are groaning too, desiring to be set free from the corruption we have to deal with, eagerly waiting for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our body, in other words, when Jesus Christ comes again, he raises the dead and he converts all the living and we receive these bodies, you see. That's what we're groaning for. That's what we're desiring. But the one thing I wanted to point out that maybe you don't realize here is that, that Paul says these two things happen at the same time. When Jesus comes again, he's going to bring in the new heavens and the earth at that time. At the time, he raises the dead and translates all the living in this rapture as he gathers us all together for the final judgment. Now that, that's actually significant. I don't have time to kind of trace that, but, but if you've ever thought those happened at two separate times, here's the text that tells you it happens at the same time. But again, the point is, we desire this new body. We prefer to be absent from the body and to be home at, with the Lord. But now, as I mentioned before, Paul does seem to skip over something something that is clearly mentioned in other parts of the Bible, and that is the middle condition, what we call the intermediate states. 
that which happens between now and the resurrection because we don't receive those glorified bodies until the resurrection, that's yet future, but there are people who have already died. So what kind of condition are they in and what kind of state can you expect if you die before Jesus Christ comes again? Well, again, we recognize that when we die, you don't receive this resurrected body right away. And we know that because Paul has already told us that isn't going to happen until Jesus returns. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, I just want to remind you that he says that we eagerly wait for a Savior, Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Okay, that's something that will happen in the future when Jesus is revealed from heaven. So resurrection body is future when Jesus comes again. He's also very clear in this passage that I've just read, the one that is still on the screen behind me, that the glorified body that you will receive is the same body that you have now. Okay? He says he will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So he's saying the body you have now is the body that's going to be transformed. And he also writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44, it is sown a perishable body. It, okay, your body. It's sown perishable, but it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. I told you, spiritual body perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And I think one further proof that you don't receive these, these bodies until Jesus Christ comes again is because I believe without exception, every believer who has ever died, well, I can't say without exception, there are two exceptions in Scripture, Enoch and Elijah. And of course, Jesus was already raised. But accepting them, everybody else had to leave their body behind. That's just the way it is. When a Christian dies, and I think you probably know some believers who have died, their bodies don't ascend into heaven after their souls as you're standing there watching. You, that's not what happens. Instead, you take their body and you bury it in the hope of the resurrection. And those bodies are still there until the resurrection. So it can't be the resurrection. You don't get the resurrection body after, immediately after you die. It's not something entirely new. It's your body, the one you have now. It's going to be raised and changed, and that is yet future. You know, uh, some believe that some of these passages are actually teaching that your soul and your body both go into the ground waiting for the resurrection. In other words, that there's a soul sleep, that you sleep until Jesus returns. But I do want you to see, and maybe you've met some people like that, Seventh-day Adventists believe that. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any others, but if you run into them, you can tell them that isn't the case because our passage plainly tells us that when you die, you go home. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. You see, he's, he's telling us here when you're absent from the body, you go to be with the Lord. He tells us even more plainly in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 24, with regard to his own desire to, to die, basically, and to go to be with Christ. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Now, what he's saying is to depart from the bodies to be with the Lord. If that wasn't true, then what was Paul struggling with here? Why would he want to die? He only wanted to die so he could be with Christ. But if he knew that if he died, he would just go into the grave and sleep until Jesus returns, why would he want to die? He could still live on and serve the Lord more and bear more fruit. See, that was what he was struggling between. I want, to, I want to be with Christ, but if I stay here, I can still labor. I can still do uh, good for the Lord. I can glorify Him. So that's the struggle because 
when you die, you go to be with the Lord. The same thing in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus tells us exactly the same thing. Luke 16, verses 22 through 23. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. Now if you read the parables, you'll see that Jesus never, never illustrates spiritual truth with something that isn't true. It's something that doesn't happen. He always illustrates it with things that everybody knew are true. He draws his pictures from reality. Some have argued this is just a parable. Jesus didn't really mean that, you know, that when, the, when Lazarus died, he was carried away by the angels into heaven, or when the rich man died, he was, in, he was in hell. They basically go into the grave to sleep. That isn't the case. Jesus doesn't make fiction. He doesn't just draw up things that, are, that, are, that aren't true in order to illustrate truth, you see. Plus, many believe that this story isn't really a parable because Jesus, only in this parable, actually gives a name to one of the characters. There's a man named Lazarus, and in all the other parables, there's not. There was a Samaritan. There was a Jew. You know, he, he just uses generalizations, but here there's actually a name. So many believe he was actually referring to something that happened. When you die, your soul doesn't go to sleep. When you die, you immediately go to heaven. You go home where you get to see the Father, where you actually get to see Jesus seated at his right hand, where you get to be with the souls of righteous men made perfect, where you actually are made perfect in holiness, where you are because you don't have your bodies at, that, at this time and you're basically a disembodied spirit. You're free from every physical pain and suffering, any kind of emotional pain. I do believe that you are clearly filled with the Spirit. And in this place, in this condition, you are as happy as you can possibly be. You know, there's, the only way that we can possibly even understand anything of what this is like is God has given us a Spirit as a down payment to give us something of that spiritual joy. Just think about the time you felt the closest to the Lord and most filled with His love. And then amplify that off the scale so your heart is just bursting with happiness and joy. That's what heaven's going to be like all the time. Just feeling like if I get any happier, I'm just going to burst. That is what heaven is like. And that's the condition in which you're going to be before the throne of God waiting for the resurrection where you will receive your glorified bodies and at that time perhaps even have a new added dimension to your, your happiness because now you have another instrument in which to, ex to experience it. You have your body back as it were and you're not experiencing it just in your soul but now you get to experience it in your bodies. By the way, Jonathan Edwards had something very uh, terrifying for those who, who don't trust in the Lord. When he says right now the souls of the unbeliever are suffering in hell and they're suffering in a way that, that is only spiritual in nature because it's only their souls that are suffering. But once their bodies are raised from the dead because they get raised as well, the tombs are emptied out on the day of, of, of re, you know, judgment, on the resurrection. They're going to receive those bodies too and they're going to be not glorified bodies but they will be resurrected bodies. Edwards believed that these bodies will be perfectly fitted for hell, for the lake of fire, in the same way that, that our glorified bodies are perfectly fitted to enjoy the blessings of heaven, which means a new dimension is going to be added to the sufferings of those who haven't trusted Jesus Christ. They're going to suffer not only in soul, but now in body for the rest of eternity. A good reason to listen to John and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that you might receive life. But for those of you who have trusted in the Lord, to realize that when you die, there's going to be all this blessedness in heaven, but there's also going to be this added dimension when you receive your resurrected body. Now let me just say in closing, what we saw this morning, and I'd like to remind you of that again right now as we prepare to come to the table. The only reason that you and I are going to enjoy any of these things, 
The only reason you and I are not going to suffer in hell forever in these horrible ways we've already considered, the only reason why you have a glorious future to look forward to is because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, because God sent his son into the world to die on a cross so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life, would have these things we've just been looking at. So I just would encourage you as you come to the Lord's table tonight, remember what Jesus has done. Remember the blessings that come to you through what Jesus has done. Remember to thank him, not only by giving him your full and complete attention as we come to his table and remember his death, but by surrendering your life entirely to him, by doing what the Apostle Paul actually exhorts you to do in light of everything he's just told us in the last verse, verse 9. You know, thinking about all these blessings we have to look forward to when we die, we have this, this body, we have, you know, we're going home to be with the Lord and so forth. He says this, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. The Lord reveals these things to us. He wants us to know what these blessings are. He wants us to know through whom they come. But he also wants us to know what's in store for us to motivate us to do something. And that is to be pleasing to him. So that should be our ambition. We talk about people being ambitious after various things. Well, we need to be more ambitious for what God calls us to do. Whether we're at home with the Lord or at absent from him, in other words, whether we're there or here, to be pleasing to him. And that's what we should purpose to do as we come to the table, to desire to be more pleasing to the Lord. Well, let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply uh, his word to our lives.